Chapter 1. Listening is a gem that is lost in this technological generation. In these modern times, we are encouraged to listen. Listen to our hearts, to our inner voices, and to our guts. However, we are rarely encouraged to listen attentively to other people. We live in a world where a value is placed on what you project, not what you absorb. Listening is very underrated, as it is even more valuable than speaking. Listening is undoubtedly the most important part of communication. It is only by listening that we understand, engage, connect, empathize, and develop as human beings. Listening is fundamental to any successful relationship, personal, professional, and political. Listening is important, and it goes beyond just hearing what people say. It is also paying attention to how they say it and what they do while they're saying it, in what context, and how what they say resonates within you. When done well and intentionally, listening can transform your understanding of the people and the world around you, thereby enriching and elevating your experiences and existence. It is how you develop wisdom and form relevant relationships. At the end of it all, we are the sum of what we attend to in life. To listen selectively, poorly, or not at all, is to limit your understanding of the world and deprive yourself of becoming the best you can be. This bite-sized book draws you deep into the effects of listening and lack of listening, showing you the better way. Lives have been lost, wars fought, fortunes lost, and friendships wrecked for lack of listening. Kate Murphy Chapter 2. People can get lonely and miserable when they do not listen. Sociology and psychology researchers have begun warning of an epidemic of loneliness in the United States. Experts call it a public health crisis, as feeling disconnected and isolation increases the risk of premature death as much as alcoholism and obesity combined. The negative health impact of loneliness is actually worse than smoking 14 cigarettes per day. While you might not expect it to be this serious, people get lonely from lack of listening, and it can result in severe health issues. Most people are lonely not because they are alone, but largely due to a lack of connection. Lonely people have nobody with whom to share their feelings and thoughts, just as they have no one who shares thoughts and feelings with them. Loneliness is a worldwide phenomenon, and it doesn't discriminate. Recent research indicates no major differences between men and women or between races when it comes to feeling disconnected. It does show, however, that Generation Z, the first generation raised on screens, is the most likely to feel lonely. Adolescents today are less likely to date, hang out with friends, get a driver's license, or even leave home without their parents. They are spending time alone at home with their devices. They end up being terrible communicators as the virtues of listening are not reinforced by social media. Chapter 3. While we live in a world where the art of listening is hardly recognized, everyone must work to develop their listening skills. Listening is more of a mindset than a checklist of do's and don'ts. It's a very particular skill that develops over time by interacting with all kinds of people without agenda or having aids there to jump in if the conversation goes anywhere unexpected. Listeners may take on some level of risk by making themselves available when they don't know what they will hear, but the greatest risk is remaining aloof and oblivious to the people and the world around them. We might wonder why we need to cultivate our listening skills in this technological era. Electronic communication is unarguably more efficient. However, listening, more than any other activity, 
plugs us into life. Listening helps us to understand ourselves as much as those speaking to us. Even though the ruling culture neither supports nor encourages the art of listening, an individual can train himself on how to listen properly. There's a lot of advice out there about how to be a better listener, mostly by business consultants and executive coaches who wrap the same ideas in different terms and catchphrases. The advice boils down to showing that you are paying attention by maintaining eye contact, nodding, throwing in a "Mm mm-hmm here and there, and giving no interruptions. The premise is to listen in a prescribed way to get what one wants. We don't need to act like we are paying attention if we are, in fact, paying attention. Listening may help achieve our goals, but that shouldn't be our only motivation. Get rid of all distractions and listen attentively. The following are the most frequently cited bad listening behaviors. Responding illogically or vaguely to what was just said. Interrupting. Looking at a watch, phone, around the room or otherwise away from the speaker. Fidgeting. Tapping on the table, frequently shifting position, clicking a pen, etc. If you do these things, stop. While that alone is not going to make you a good listener, it will make it less obvious that you are a bad listener. Did you know? Hearing is one of the last senses one loses before they die. Dying patients retain their senses of hearing and touch until the very end. Chapter 4. Assumption hinders true understanding and should be avoided. The reason people often feel unheard and misunderstood by their partners is largely because people in long-term relationships tend to lose their curiosity for each other. They become convinced they know each other better than they do and do not listen because they think they already know what the other person will say. We all make assumptions when it comes to those we love. It's called the closeness communication bias. As wonderful as familiarity and intimacy are, they make us complacent, leading us to overestimate our ability to read those closest to us. Relying on the past to understand someone in the present is doomed for failure. The sum of daily interactions and activities continually shapes us and adds nuances to our understanding of the world so that no one is the same as yesterday, nor will today's self be identical to tomorrow's. Attitudes, opinions, and beliefs change, so it doesn't matter how long we have known or how well we think we know someone. If we stop listening, we will eventually lose our grasp of who they are and how to relate to them. Listening is how we stay connected to one another as the pages turn in our lives. Most people think other people are influenced by stereotypes, but are oblivious to how often they, themselves, make knee-jerk assumptions. Research shows we all harbor prejudices because of our unconscious drive to categorize and the inherent difficulty of imagining realities we have not experienced firsthand. None of us are woke or fully awake to the realities of people who are unlike us, and at the same time, none of us can claim to share the same mindset or values as people who we think are like us. This is the reason it is wrong when people say things such as speaking as a woman of color or speaking as a white man. One can only speak for oneself. By listening, we might find comfort in shared values and similar experiences, but we'll also find many points where we diverge, and it's by acknowledging and accepting those differences that we learn and develop understanding. Chapter 5. Mental diversions actually prevent us from digesting important points of a conversation. 
Have you ever been talking to someone and got so distracted by your thoughts that the person got literally put on mute? You completely stop hearing everything that person says until a stray word snaps you back to attention. Many times we find ourselves drifting away this way right in the middle of a conversation. This brief exit from a conversation is caused by the speech thought differential, which refers to the fact that we can think a lot faster than someone can talk. The average person talks at around 120 to 150 words per minute, and this only takes up a tiny fraction of our mental bandwidth, which is powered by 86 billion brain cells. So we often get to wander in our excess cognitive capacity, thinking about a multitude of other things, which keeps us from focusing on the speaker's narrative. This explains why, when someone talks, we take mental side trips, thinking about things relevant or irrelevant to the ongoing conversation. Too often, we get absorbed in our musings, diverting our attention just a little too long, getting somewhat behind in the discourse. Having missed parts of the gist, we unconsciously try to fill in the gaps and, as a result, what the person is saying starts to make less sense. And rather than admit our confusion at this point, we sink once again into our sea of thoughts. The greatest barrier to keeping our minds on track and following someone's narrative is the nagging concern about what we're going to say when it's our turn. The irony, however, is that when we let our minds wander as a result of thinking of the perfect response, we actually increase our chances of responding inappropriately. The more we think about the right thing to say, the more we miss, and the more likely we'll say the wrong thing when it gets to our turn. Worrying about what to say next works against us. Our responses will be better. Our connections will be stronger, our conversations will be more interesting, and we'll be more at ease if we free up our minds to listen. Chapter 6 Listening to opposing views can be productive and should be done often. It's easy to think that one must not fall into the trap of attentively listening to opposing views. What if opening oneself to hearing another person's opinion makes one less firm in one's own? People worry that if they really pay attention or really understand the other side's point of view, they will lose sight of what matters to them, so they only listen to individuals and media that affirm their viewpoints. When our deeply held positions or beliefs are challenged, if there's the slightest whiff that we might be wrong, it feels like a threat. This is false. Of course, no one has to wait their turn or listen to views that make them uncomfortable on social media. It's democratic in that everyone can air their unmediated and unedited opinion, but it's undemocratic in that people selectively listen to only those who make them feel secure in their positions, breeding insular thinking and alternative facts. The result is that we are no longer drawing on common sources of information. We only become secure in our convictions by allowing them to be challenged. Disagreements and sharp differences of opinion are inevitable, whether they are over political ideology, ethical issues, business dealings, or personal matters. When engaged in any kind of dispute, it is important to listen for evidence that we might be wrong and not just listen to poke holes in the other person's argument. We should be open to the possibility that we might be wrong. That way, we can get more out of the conversation. Listening does not translate to a total agreement with someone. Instead, it means accepting the legitimacy of the other person's point of view. It also means that we embrace the possibility that there might be multiple truths and understanding them all might lead to a larger truth. Chapter 7. 
Listening is important for a successful comedy career as much as it is in the advancement of any career. Listening is critical to be successful at improvisational comedy. Controlling the narrative and grasping for attention make for one-sided conversations and kill collaboration. Rather than advancing one's agenda, all it does is hold one back. Whether telling jokes or just trying to inject a little levity into a conversation, one won't be funny unless one carefully and accurately reads the audience. Listening is essential to being funny. Humor is an asset in forming and maintaining relationships both professionally and personally. In work environments, successful attempts at humor lead to perceptions of competence and confidence. People don't so much have a fixed sense of humor as a variable ability to sense humor, depending on how well they listen. Making a joke also involves being vulnerable. When someone puts themselves out there, hoping their humor will be appreciated, they are more likely to take that risk if the other person has proven to be an attentive and responsive listener, and vice versa. Shared humor is a primary indicator of feelings of connectedness. Kate Murphy People who fear intimacy tend to use divisive, put-downs, or mean humor, which discourages listening by making people defensive. Shared humor is a form of connection born out of listening. It is a collaborative dynamic that involves the exploration and elaboration of ideas and feelings. The same improvisational interplay is required for any cooperative endeavor. This is why listening is so crucial in the modern work environment. Chapter 8. As much as we try to listen to others, it is important to take time out to listen to our inner selves. We all have voices in our heads. As a matter of fact, we talk to ourselves constantly about things mundane and potentially profound. We have moral arguments, assign blame and make rationalizations, analyze past events and rehearse future ones. This inner dialogue is a mental engagement everyone goes through, and it sometimes spills into external speech. And when we talk to ourselves the way we talk to another person, we engage the same parts of our brain involved with social cognition, which allows us to empathize and read other people's intentions, desires, and emotions. Listening to others determines the tone and quality of our inner dialogues. Our previous interactions teach us how to question, answer, and comment so we can do the same with ourselves when we need to solve problems, manage ethical dilemmas, and think creatively. The voices in our heads can be encouraging or defeating, caring or criticizing, complimentary or demeaning. Because they are louder, inner voices have tremendous influence. Researchers in China and the United States discovered that people who were asked to imagine repeating the syllable da rated external sounds as softer. We can also talk to ourselves this way. Cognitive behavioral therapy is all about learning how to talk to oneself differently. Many voices bring many perspectives, so aside from that therapist's voice, we might want to listen to our inner whisperings sometimes. Chapter 9. A Good Listener Supports, Not Shifts, the Conversation Good listeners are all about the support response as opposed to shift responses. Shift responses are symptomatic of conversational narcissism, which ruins any chance of connection. While shift responses are usually self-referential statements, support responses are usually other-directed questions, curious questions meant to elicit more information and not subtly impose your own opinion. Asking open-ended questions like, what was your reaction, works better than, didn't that piss you off? 
The ultimate goal is to understand the speaker's point of view, not sway it. Because people like to appear knowledgeable, they ask questions to suggest they already know the answer or they frame questions in a way that prompts the answers they want. Kate Murphy Good questions do not begin with, don't you think, isn't it true, or wouldn't you agree, and they definitely don't end with, right? These are actually camouflaged shift responses that will likely lead others to give incomplete and somewhat dishonest and inaccurate answers that fit the questioner's opinions and expectations. Beware of questions that contain hidden assumptions. Instead of, what made you decide to become a sociologist? It's better to ask, how did it happen that you became a sociologist? Shift response is really just a narcissistic attempt to redirect the conversation back to oneself. Rather than listen, people who give shift responses respond by trying to solve or explain away their own problems. No matter what, it is always better to resist the impulses to do the following. Suggest you know how someone feels. Identify the cause of the problem. Tell someone what to do about the problem minimize their concerns, bring perspective to a situation with forced positivity and platitudes, admire the person's strength. Indeed, being aware of someone's troubles does not necessarily mean we need to fix them. People usually aren't looking for a solution, they just want a sounding board. No matter how good our intentions or how sage we think our advice is, people reflectively resist and resent directives, albeit greatly delivered. So the best we can do is listen. Chapter 10 A bad listener isn't necessarily a bad person. They might just have a mishearing. Processing is one of the most intricate and involving things we ask our brains to engage in. And what we do know is that each side of the brain has an auditory cortex conveniently located near the ears. If it is injured or removed, we will have no awareness of sound, although we might have some reflexive reaction to it. You will flinch at the thud of thunder, but you won't know why. The Wernicke's area, named after German neurologist Karl Wernicke, is key to the comprehension of speech. Stroke patients with lesions in that area could actually still hear and speak, but were unable to comprehend what was said to them. It is not certain how many other areas of the brain are recruited in speech comprehension or how much variability there is between humans. It is, however, reasonable to suspect that a fantastic listener who picks up every nuance in a conversation is firing more neurons in more parts of the brain than a bad listener. When we listen to people, our brain not only processes the words, it also processes pitch volume, tone, and flow of tone. This explains how humans can sometimes interpret the emotional aspect of a message even when the words are completely obscured. There are one too many mishearings that lead people into being bad listeners. Many people can be bad listeners because they truly can't hear well and their brains are working in strange ways to make up for it. While some mishearings can be humorous, hearing loss, in the long run, leads to a litany of poor emotional and social outcomes, some of which are the following. Irritability, negativism, anger, fatigue, tension, stress, and depression. Avoidance or withdrawal from social situations. Social rejection and loneliness. Reduced job performance and earning power. Diminished psychological and overall health. It is indeed important to protect one's hearing by keeping the volume on sound systems in a safe range and wearing earplugs when in noisy environments. It's also very good to get our ears checked if we suspect our listening problems have a psychological component. It is important to take care of our ears as they are completely essential to hearing.
Chapter 11. While listening attentively is advised, each person has every right to draw the curtains on listening to the other person. Sometimes one actually needs to make the call to stop listening. While we can learn from everyone, it doesn't mean we have to listen to everyone until they run out of breath. We all have limited time in a day, so we make choices, consciously and unconsciously, about who gets our time and attention. Paul Grice, a British language philosopher and theorist, came up with the idea that human beings have certain expectations and conversations that, when violated, make us less inclined to listen. This is largely due to the fact that communication is fundamentally a cooperative endeavor, so if we perceive our partners aren't keeping their ends of the bargain, we are going to feel cheated and want out of the deal. The conversational expectations are summarized in four maxims. Maxim of quality, we expect the truth. Maxim of quantity, we expect to get the information we don't already know and not so much that we feel overwhelmed. Maxim of relation, we expect relevance and logical flow. Maxim of manner, we expect the speaker to be reasonably brief, orderly, and unambiguous. It can be difficult to listen to someone when there are barrages of anger, frustration, and distrust between the two parties. In such cases, refusing to listen comes easily, but just as one should be mindful and intentional when we grant the gift of our attention, we should try to keep the same energy when we withhold it. While not listening can be justified and is a matter of practicality sometimes, nothing can change the fact that it is actually a form of rejection. Consciously or unconsciously, we are choosing to attend to something else, which implies that the person is not worth our while. This can be hurtful even when we don't mean to be, so we need to be careful not to shut someone out before giving them a benefit of an explanation or a chance to lay down the contents of their hearts. It is helpful to realize that people change, and our view of them changes when we truly listen to them. It often pays to first make an effort to listen before we decide to pull the plug. Conclusion There is a crisis of listening in the world. A lot of people want to talk, but very few want to listen, and people are really suffering from this lack of empathy. Empathy is important for any listener. It's almost impossible to develop sensitivity and respect for another person's vulnerability without knowing what it's like to be vulnerable yourself. Whether someone is confessing a misdeed, proposing an idea, revealing anxiety, sharing a dream, or recalling a significant event, know that that person is giving a piece of him or herself. And you need to handle it with care. Otherwise, the person will start to edit future conversations with you, knowing they can't be real with you. When you engage with someone, your behavior does two things. It either helps or hinders your understanding and then strengthens or weakens the relationship. Listening gets you the best of the two shots. With patience and awareness, develop your skill as a listener and start doing it really well. Listening heightens your knowledge. While it takes a great deal of effort, it is totally worth every hard work. It not only enhances your sense of awareness, but it is also the epitome of graciousness. It makes you feel, and as you become more attuned to the thoughts and emotions of others, you become more alive to the world, and it, in turn, becomes more alive to you. Try this. When next you find yourself in a conversation, try listening and responding with genuine interest to what they're saying. Don't interrupt or drift away. Just listen.